There are many cases from Unsolved Mysteries that revolve around a murder that has not been solved. Sadly, this case falls into that category. Just because a case has not been solved, should we simply let it fade away into the sands of history? This is the sad scenario of Father Ronaldo Rivera. In 1982, Father Ronaldo Rivera was brutally murdered. Was his murder tied to the disappearance of another priest in 1984? Both priests belonged to the order of Catholics known as Franciscans. My name is Jeff, aka Gkurs, and I welcome you to another installment of Black Sight, Files from Unsolved Mysteries. The case of Father Ronaldo Rivera. This case actually sticks with me a lot because when I was younger, when this first came out, uh, this case first came out, I I always kind of thought of priest as kind of like the almost being kind of untouchable because of the fact that they were that they were servants of God, basically. Now, I'll be honest, I'm going to go on record and say I'm not a religious person at all. I was when I was a little child, of course, you know. Your parents, you know, help kind of shape you into, you know, what they think you should be when you're a child. My mom, although she was not, like, hardcore religious, she did believe in God, so she kind of did pass, a, a, you know, pa, a part upon me, I guess you could say, uh, uh, you know, the ideas of what God was. So when I would watch Unsolved Mysteries with my mom, and then I saw this case when I was really young, I think I was, I was no older than seven. I think this came, this episode came out in like '88. Well, I would see that you know a, a priest was murdered. And, and that blew my mind because to me, like I said, I always thought that these guys were seen as, uh, as, you know, like I said, and invincible because they were servants of God, you know. And as I got older and we learned things, we kind of realized that not everything is as good as it should be. And we're going to be hearing about uh, two of these cases. Now, this, uh, because the Unsolved Mysteries wiki broke, or they have two individual entries for the two priests that are profiled in this case, I'm only covering the Father Ronaldo Rivera uh, case in this installment. That's why I have the, the subheading of the French Siskin connection. Basically, this case and then part two, which is John Kerrigan, will be falling underneath that uh, umbrella, basically. So this installment covers part one, and then later on when I have uh, some more free time, I will cover part two. Uh, it may be next week, and I'm hoping it will be, because I have work starting tomorrow. Uh, I'm on Labor Day. Uh, it's Labor Day right now as I'm recording this. But yeah, so uh, we're going to get to that case right after these commercials from the 1970s. Wednesday, on a special two-hour eight is enough, David says goodbye to Janet and Sacramento. Then, on Vegas, Dan falls for a body he's guarding. Has to tonight. But finds his own body on the line, right after the eight is enough special. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you are all having a great Labor Day here in the United States. I'm not sure if any other countries really celebrates Labor Day, but if they are, I hope that your Labor Day is also going, you know, very well, I guess you could say. But anyway, if you are new to this series, this is the portion of the show where I go to the Unsolved Mysteries wiki and I will look up the case so let's do that right now so let's do this and then we'll do this and then i will have the computer read to us the majority of the case and for that i would like to introduce you to my lovely secretary her name is jasmine she has been working with me since episode one if i remember correctly or the first very first you know video in this series she's been helping me with it if i remember correctly and, you know, we will use the read aloud program. The sad thing is that the program is not always <laughs> reliable, which is sad because it's actually built into the Edge browser and it always 
acts up. But anyway, anyway, let's get to the case, shall we? So let's zoom in a little bit. How's that looking? Okay, yeah, that looks pretty good. Okay, so I will read the opening bio here. So basically, we uh, have Father Ronaldo Rivera. His real name was Ronaldo John Rivera. He had no known nicknames, and the location was Santa Fe, New Mexico. The date was re uh, listed as August fifth, nineteen eighty-two. Okay, so let, let let's just hope for the very best, shall we? We're going to start with a small section here. Let, let's start with this. Okay, read aloud. Okay, please. Let's do it, Jasmine. Come on. Come on, please. Details. 57-year-old right. Father Reynaldo Rivera was a Catholic priest at St. Francis Cathedral in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He was ordained in 1953 and appointed rector of St. Francis Cathedral in 1975. Now, I'm wondering what rector means, because like I said, I even though my mom kind of taught me the basics about religion, you know, like Jesus and God and all that, I don't know like what some of these fine terms are. So let's actually do a quick research, shall we? Let's uh, see here. I'm guessing religion, or let's do church rector. What is a church rector? Residents of an S. S S uh, I can't even pronounce that. Uh, erector, rectory, res resistance. Have, although it may also be applied to home academic rector. Okay, look, it looks like the job title. A housing that a church organization provides for a minister or priest to live in. Okay, so that's what it could be. Oh, okay. I've always seen that word and I was kind of like, what does that mean? You know, and so if, you know, sometimes I will go to, uh, you know, while we're reading these cases and everything, I will go and research like something that's like, what does that mean? You know, so, so he apparently, he, uh, he was, I'm guessing the head of the living arrangements for this church. Okay. So let's go down to here. Please, please be nice. It's Liberty. Give me a break, please. Okay. This case first on the November 23rd. I knew it. I knew it. It's like, no, nope, no, nope, we're good. We're good. Okay. Hold on. Let me just make sure that there are no updates. It's up to date. It's up to date. So yeah, see this is what I mean. It's like. You would think that something that is built into the browser itself would not have a problem doing something as basic as that. But eh. so here I will read. I'm going to read some of this to you guys. So I'm just going to go down here so you guys can see exactly what the portion is I'm going to read. When they are or ordained, Catholic priests vow to become servants of God and servants of the community. Their door is always open to those in need but their faith can place them in jeopardy. A priest's willingness to help no matter who, when, or where can even threaten his own life. And this is kind of like what I was talking about uh, when I told you my mom kind of taught me the bare, the, the minimum, you know, how do I say minimum? She taught me the basics. Like the, these guys serve God. And because of that, I always thought that these guys were kind of untouchable. But then again, when you're really that young, Young kids really don't have the concept of, like, what murder is. So, I think that also feeds into it a little bit. But, yeah, this really opened my eyes up to the fact that even people who serve God, if you believe in him or not, this really kind of opens your eyes up. And, like, these guys are not as invincible as you would think. Father Rivera has been murdered, and Father John Kerrigan of Ronan, Montana, has mysteriously disappeared. Authorities fear these two cases a thousand miles and two years apart may be connected. It is even possible that a serial killer, that there is a serial killer at large who is exclusively murdering Catholic priests. Okay, let's go down here. Okay, so this is why I'm kind of breaking this case into two parts. It's because I'm not sure exactly if Everything for this case is identical to the John Kerrigan Wikipedia entry. So, like I said, 
Today I'm covering all of everything that was on the uh, Ronaldo Rivera uh, wiki. And then next time I'll cover everything on the John Kerrigan. That way, whatever is different between the two K two wikis will get covered. Okay, so on the evening of, of Thursday, August 5th, 1982, a call for help came into the rectory of St. Francis Cathedral. Pa uh, Father Patrick Gerard answered. The caller identified himself as Michael Carmelo. He was the grandfather... No, sorry. He said that his grandfather was having a heart attack and he needed a priest to come immediately to administer the last rites. <clears throat> Father Gerard told the caller that he could not leave the rectory because he was legally blind. He said that all of the other priests were taking confessions. Hmm. And before anybody asks me, I've never, uh, I've never even gone to church. So I, I, I understand the idea of confessions, like what they do. I think you sit like in a, uh, like in a isolated room that has like a viewing window or something that like, there's two of these things. One sits here, the other sits here, and there's like a wall between them. And basically, this is where you can tell the priest, like, all your deepest, darkest secrets, basically. And that, that's never happened to me, so. Father Gerard, okay, b before I continue, though, it kind of makes me wonder that if all the priests were, ta were taking confessions, isn't there, like, a protocol that if there's an emergency, like, say the one remaining priest like say this father gerard he could possibly somehow alert a, a normal another priest and say hey this guy is dying could we possibly you know like switch out the priest one priest or another i guess you could say you know i don't know how things go in church so i don't know if that protocol would be accepted you know okay so father gerard Asked the caller to try again in 15 minutes. Well, at this point, the guy's grandfather probably dead already. Uh, exactly 15 minutes later, at 8.30 p.m., the telephone rang again. This time, Father Rivera took the call. The caller repeated his story. He said that he was at the La Bahada, La Bahada, I think that's how you pronounce it, rest stop on Interstate 25, uh, 20 miles south of Santa Fe, he asked Father Rivera to meet him there. The caller said that uh, he would then drive Father Rivera to his grandfather's house near Waldo, New Mexico. See, that's the one thing I would never do. Even if I was a priest, and priests are supposed to be trusting of people, I'd be like, uh, "I'll you stay in your car and I'll follow you. If somebody literally came up to me and goes, hey, Jeff, I need your help, yeah, I'll help. I will help people, you know. You're like, hey, Jeff, I need your help. I'm like, Let, let's do it. How can I help you, you know? And then they're like, okay, get in my car. I'm going to take you somewhere. I'd be like, whoa, 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 hold on. Hold the brakes. Pump the brakes, dude. I'll follow you. I don't trust anybody. Call, call me cynical. I trust no one. I don't trust anyone. The last person I, I trusted without any without any regret or anything she died everybody else is like yeah I'll, I'll follow you in my car i just don't get into buddy into anyone's car willy-nilly like that okay so since father rivera agreed to the plan and asked caller how he would recognize him the caller said that he was driving a blue pickup truck he then asked Father Rivera what he was driving. Father Rivera uh, said he would be in a 1974 cream-colored Chevrolet Malibu. Uh, he then told the caller that he could get there in 20 minutes at 8.45 after the call was completed. Father Rivera left in his car. Now, just because I say I would not get into somebody's car, you know, if they ask for help, it does mean I will not get into the car, period. Uh, there's times, you know, that I'll ask for a ride and they'll, people will be nice enough to give it and I'll give them gas money. But literally, if they go, hey, Jeff, I need your help. And I don't even know the person. That That's the first thing. If I don't even know the person and go, like, hey, Jeff, I need help, I'll be like, okay, I'll help however I can. I'll be kind of limited because I don't know the person. And if they said get in my car, I'll be like, yeah, no thanks. I'll drive. 
I'll drive my car, you know, like, because where I live, uh, there are a lot of people who will post, uh, like, there are a couple Facebook groups, and in these groups, people will, uh, you know, post that they need help either going from point A to point B because they don't have a car or their car doesn't have gas. And when I see those kind of postings, I'm really sketchy. But then there are, I've literally seen people like, sure, I'll be right there. Send me the message, you know, like send me your address or whatever. People are just, I think, honestly, people trust too easily when their basic instincts should be telling them to be careful. Anyway. Okay, let's see if the computer will pick this up. So let's try it again, shall we? Come on. Please. AR. When Father Rivera did not return to the rectory that night, he was reported missing. Authorities began a search for him in the Waldo area. Hundreds of citizens from Santa Fe volunteered to help in the search. They searched on foot, horseback, in four-wheelers, and from the air. They combed the hills and the desert. Lieutenant Gilbert Ulibari of the Santa Fe Police Department says that almost everyone in Santa Fe knew Father Rivera. He had an impact on many of their L. Uh, in many of their lives, the program does not always catch the last word. So apparently we have a priest who was well-liked in the community, which makes it even worse. It's because of the fact that you know somebody and they're taken from uh, everybody. On Saturday, October 7th, two days after the search began, Father Rivera's body was found on a desolated dirt road off of Interstate 25, south of Santa Fe, about a mile east of the Waldo exit, and three miles from the rest stop. He had been shot in the abdomen. His hands had been bound. A mark on his neck indicated he may have been restrained with a wire. Other evidence suggests that he had been tied up and restrained for a period of time. So apparently, since they had, it was not instantaneous that uh, he was killed. They had him restrained, which was, which in my mind, as we're you know reading this, in my mind, I'm starting to think, why would they, why would they restrain the guy instead of just simply shooting him? And the first thing that kind of popped in my mind is maybe they were getting orders from somebody. Or, if not getting orders, maybe it was like a hit job. And possibly uh, they had to make, get a possible confirmation that this was the person. Now keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, keep in mind, this, is, this was in the, in the uh, early 80s. We didn't have cell phones like this. Well, you can't even see it. Wow. Wow, because like this, you can't even see it. Okay, I have to put it like this. We don't have cell phones. We didn't have cell phones like this, you know, back. Here, can I kind of do this. Will this pick up any better? Okay, there. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Uh, we didn't have cell phones like this back then, so we couldn't just take a picture and text our, our the crime lord and go, hey, boss, is this the guy? You know, like, no. So they probably had to restrain him and then... Uh, you know, like send out somebody to get positive identification. But that's what I'm thinking. If it was a simple, just a simple murder job, like 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 a robbery or something, and I think they cover that in this portion of the case. If it was a simple robbery job, they would have just killed the guy and be done with it. But they restrained him, then they shot him. So I'm I'm wondering if possibly that this could have been more than just a simple robbery, you know. But anyway, in the comment section, what do you think? Do you think that them restraining him was in order to get confirmation of who this guy was? Or do you think that uh, it was just a simple robbery that took a weird turn? After Father Rivera's body was found, the mayor of Santa Fe declared a day of mourning. At the funeral, the entire city grieved, devastated by his brutal murder. Corinne Martinez, secretary of St. Francis Cathedral, says that from Saturday until his burial, Santa Fe was awe-stricken. Awe Sorry about that. I scratched my ear. No matter what religion everybody was, they were all just one at the time. During the 
procession from the cathedral to the cemetery. The streets were full and the sidewalks were lined with people who came to pay their respects. Okay, let's actually go down to here and we'll, we'll try the computer again. Okay, let's try this. Come on. Come on. I know you can do it. Come on. Pex. Father Antonio Valdez of St. Francis of Assisi says that Father Rivera went out on this call as an act of charity and love. He thinks that because Father Rivera showed this love for people, the people of Santa Fe responded. When Father Rivera died, they felt sadness in their hearts because they loved him. His sister, Elizabeth Abeda, says that everybody loved him. She is sure he is happy where he where he is now. You know, I'll be honest. I, I don't see that kind of uh when people die like where I live, it, it's literally just seen as like a blurb in the obituaries nowadays. When somebody dies, you don't you don't really don't hear, you know, like big outcry for it, you know, outcry about it. You know, you, you don't see streets being lined. Or anything so that, that's actually something i think that's kind of gone by the wayside uh but yeah so let's continue on let's see how let's see if the computer will keep doing a good job come on come on i know you can do it come on let's do it this case first on the november really? 23rd really oh my god now i gotta try to figure out where i left where it left off Okay. Okay, hold on. Let's sister. Let's just do this. There we go. Um. Really think it's. Oh my God! This. Okay, there it is. Uh, loved him. We're uh, see murder. Still miss him. Uh, happy where he is now. Okay, here we go. Here, I'll read this part. I'll read this part. Let me get a quick drink. But she and the rest of her family still miss him. On the night of the murder, the man calling himself Michael Carmelo told Father Rivera that he would be waiting for him at the law. Bahada, I think that's how you pronounce that. Rest stop. In a blue pickup truck, investigators discovered that the phone at the truck stop at the rest stop was out of service that night. So apparently he had to have been calling from uh, another location. Yes, there were some early model cell phones, but they were more uh they were more you know kind of a rare oddity at this time okay let's see here um so uh, the call had to have been made somewhere else lieutenant ulibari has discovered a theory of what happened that night he believes that the killer or killer killers probably at the rest stop were at the rest stop waiting for father rivera when he arrived there, they signaled him out and convinced him to get into their vehicle. And that's where I'd be like, nope, 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 I'm sorry, you, nope, nope, I'll follow you. Okay, let's try it again, come on, come on, please. Come on. This case for Ah uh, God. I'm guessing let's see here. I'm guessing I may have to read the rest of this because of the fact that it is just now it's not even working. Normally I could get at least a couple consecutive uh paragraphs in before it starts acting up. It's just acting up. I mean I'm not even getting a real chance. 
Lieutenant Ulibarri does not believe that one person could have handled Father Rivera because he would have given them a hard time. He believes that at least two people were involved in subduing Father Rivera because he was very strong. He also believes that they controlled Father Rivera with a gun. And this, like I said, if, there, if it was a simple robbery, why would they... Why would... Oh, why would they have a... Uh, if it was going to be a simple robbery, why would they have needed to res restrain him? No, I think that this could be... That there was a more... That there was another level to this crime that happened. Rest like I said, if you're just going to rob somebody, you're just going to want to get it done and over with. To restrain somebody possibly could leave that victim uh, available to uh, identify. But the fact is they restrained him. And this could have been possibly for a while because they said there was marks around his neck. But apparently nothing was found around his neck at the time. That that indicates that possibly this was over a, a couple hours. Which means that he could have recognized the people. I still think that it's possibly that they were trying to get identification to make sure that this was the guy that they were supposed to move upon. Lieutenant Ulibarri believes the killers took for, uh, Father Rivera to a remote desert area where they forced him out of their vehicle out of their vehicle and killed him. They then drove to the dirt road near Waldo and dumped the body. Uh, Lieutenant Ulibarri says the killers could have hidden Father Rivera anywhere in the Waldo area. He knows that there are several areas where you can hide a body and it will never be found. Okay, now that kind of makes me wonder, like, how would he exactly know that? He believes that he believes the killers wanted Father R uh, Rivera to be found. After the crime, the killers returned to the rest stop to remove Father Rivera's car. It was found Saturday, August 7th at a rest stop along Interstate 40, just east of Grants, uh, New Mexico, about 110 miles from Santa Fe. The doors were locked and the gas tank was empty. The keys were missing. There was little physical evidence found inside. No blood stains were found. Uh, there was nothing to indicate that anyone had even driven the car. It had been wiped clean. So this kind of makes me wonder if they, if they, I don't understand why some, some of the, some of what they're saying, I don't understand because they're saying that they put, got him into the truck. They then got him out of the truck, killed him. Where exactly did the restraining aspect come in I, I don't understand did they get him into the truck then restrain him or did they get him out of the truck res uh, restrain him and that's when they made the identification and then once they realized that this guy was who their target was that's when they decided to kill him is that what they're trying to say here it's it's kind of it's kind of nebulous about how what what they're saying here okay but they found the car and since n no blood was found in the car it's evident that he was he was not killed at the car okay okay let's try it again let's try it again let's try it again come on please Head clean. Uh, I'll, I'll the Santa Fe police had few clues, and after a nationwide check, they found no suspects named Michael Carmelo. Regarding motive, Lieutenant Ulibarri believes that Father Rivera was not the target. He believes a Catholic priest was the target for whatever reason. Robbery was not a motive because there was nothing taken from Father Rivera other than his last rites kit, which included a prayer book, a vial of holy oil, a communion wafer, a candle, and a crucifix. Lieutenant Ulibarri wonders if the kit was taken as a souvenir. He says the killer may have taken it so that he could relive the experience. Every time he looks at it, he remembers kill. Uh, remembers killing... God damn it. Come on. Remembers killing a priest. 
I don't think think that he took it as a souvenir i'm wondering if he took it as a way to uh poss maybe possibly had rivera's uh ronaldo rivera's uh identity like uh his name in the book or whatever like written on the cover of the book you know and maybe they were uh waiting and waiting and waiting for this identification of ronaldo rivera but it did not come in it did not arrive so they basically like, okay, screw it. They killed Father Ronaldo Rivera. They took the last rights kit and they left. Maybe as a way to go to their boss, if this was like a hit, they went to the boss and said, hey, we reached out to you guys. Nobody contacted us. Here's what this guy had. And then they could check the book and say on the cover, it had Ronaldo Rivera's name written on it. I, I think it was taken as a form of identification, to be honest. Like how some hitmen will be told to bring back like a, a necklace or a ring or something personal of their target. That's what I'm actually thinking. Okay. Now this is where it kind of uh, splinters into the other priest. His name is John Kerrigan. Now, when, like I said, I'm not sure if everything in this wiki is going to be the same as in the other wiki. So we're going to go through all of this no matter what. But this wiki, this uh, installment actually was just uh, focusing on uh, Ronaldo Rivera. We're now going into John Kerrigan. So let's let's continue on, shall we? Okay, let's reload. Come on, please. Inga Priest. Two years later, on Friday, July 20th, 1984, another priest mysteriously disappeared. 58-year-old Father John Kerrigan was new to the Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Ronin, Montana. He had only been there two days before he, too, vanished. For the previous two years, he had served at a parish in Plains, Montana. On the night he disappeared, Father Kerrigan went for a walk around Ronin. At 11 p.m., he stopped at Denold's Bakery, across the street from the church, to chat with his new parishioners. He told them he was planning to attend a funeral and a wedding in Plains the next day. After a few minutes, he left, saying he was going to return to the rectory. Wow, uh... When was the last time, uh, let's see here. Okay, so he went to the rectory, that's, uh... That's when he was last seen. Uh, rectory and then go to, and go to bed. Okay, let me. When was the last time? Now it's probably different in bigger cities, but where I live, with the exception of like I think like the AM PM uh, minute mark where up here where I live, almost everything is fucking closed down by like eleven. Uh, the. We have a safe uh, store across the street where I live called Safeway, and they close at eleven. The only other uh, big name store in this area that is open twenty four hours is a grocery store in Longview. There, there could be some minute marts uh, also that are open twenty four hours. I'm not sure, but the fact is that he went to a bakery. Let's see here. Uh... Uh, he went to a bakery at 11 p.m. When was there? When was the last time you ever saw a bakery that was opened at 11 p.m.? If there was a bakery where I lived that was open at 11 p.m., hell yeah, I'd go down there and get me some donuts or some croissants or something. But yeah, this this town, the Kelso, Washington, is dead by 11 p.m. That's why I have to wait till like 6 a.m. to get gas for my vehicle if I ever want to get gas because everything like gas stations are closed and everything. But anyway, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm just rambling. I'm just rambling. Uh, so the next day, Saturday, July the 21st, Father Kerrigan did not show up for his first mass at the church uh, that morning at the turn turn out turn out along Highway 35 next to eastern shore of Flathead Lake, about five miles north of Ronan. A local fruit peddler was setting up her fruit stand when she discovered a pile of fo folded bloody clothes. 
the items included a shirt, shoes, a windbreaker, and a windbreaker jacket, or and a windbreaker jacket. Sorry, she immediately called the police. After Father Kerrigan was reported missing that Monday, the clothes were identified as his. The blood matched his blood type. Hairs found on the clothes matched his hair. A $100 bill was in the shirt pocket. The shirt had no marks from a bullet, knife, or other weapon. Interestingly, the clothes were found the clothes found were not the ones he was wearing when he visited the bakery. Why the fuck did he change his clothing? And the fact that they found the $100 in his shirt pocket, that indicates that this was not whatever happened to him was not a robbery. They would have taken that $100 bill. Okay, let's go down. Let's let, let's try this and see how the uh let's see here. Come on. Please. I'm begging you, please. Please. Come on. I'd the bakery. The police conducted a search of the area around the fruit stand and on the hill behind it. A bloody coat hanger was found close to the clothing. Detective Sergeant Bruce Phillips of the Lake County Sheriff's Office concluded that the hanger was used either to strangle, gag, or tie up Father Kerrigan. The police were unable to determine what exactly it was used for, but they are certain it is connected to the case. Sergeant Phillips says it was not just lying there, it had been deformed and used for some purpose. A week later, on Sunday, July 29th, Father Kerrigan's car, a white and brown 1976 Chevrolet Impala, was found abandoned in a pasture alongside Skyline Drive in Polson, Montana, five miles south of the area where his clothes had been discovered. It had been wiped clean of fingerprints. Sergeant Phillips says they know that the car sat there for about a week before. Before it was discovered. Now, something they said kind of made me uh, kind of scratch my head. Not not literally because you, you didn't see me do it. But anyway, they said that it was used to either gag or tie up uh, Father Kerrigan. Now, I had, when I was younger, I used to have wire hangers. I don't understand how they could think that a wire hanger could be used as a gag. Because at the, at the most, you'd have like a little piece of metal that's going against your lips. And you could still open your mouth. All right, all right. You know, they're still going to fucking talk you know they're still gonna fucking talk and they're probably gonna be pissed you know like ah, you know like like I, I don't understand i can understand it as a way to strain or uh strangle but to gag yeah I'm, I'm not really i'm not really understanding how they think that a uh, wired hanger could be used to gag somebody okay so here i'll read this part Although search, a thorough search of the area was conducted, the car keys were found lying in the tall grass about 30 yards away. Blood was found in the front passenger seat, door panel, and floorboard. Several personal effects were found inside as well. In the trunk, they found a shovel and a pillow with blood on them. Blood also splattered inside the trunk. Because there was rust on the shovel blade, police do not believe that they used it. It was used to bury Father Kerrigan's body. So basically, due to the fact that there is blood, and apparently a lot of it, I think it's safe to say that uh, Father Kerrigan was also murdered, that this was not just a disappearance. Because uh, they have his case listed as a disappearance, which you will find in the next installment. Okay, guys, I'm going to take a quick break. I got to use the restroom. I'm going to stop recording, and then when I return, it will be with continuation. So stay tuned, and I'll be right back. Okay, everybody, welcome back. I I feel a little bit better now that I went to the restroom. I shouldn't be drinking all that water, but, you know, you get thirsty and everything. So let's continue on. So let's, let's go do this. The police were surprised to find $1,200 in Father Kerrigan's wallet, which was also in the trunk. Wait, hold on. Uh, in his Father Kerrigan's wallet, which was also in the trunk in a box labeled wallets. According to Sergeant Phillips, the money was not hidden in, a, in the wallet. None of it 
was disturbed. So the police do not believe robbery was a motive. No, this sounds like it was a personal, uh, a per like a one a personal issue. They have theorized that he may have been called in to administer last rites since his sacramental holy oils were missing. Okay, so let's let's go down to here and see how the computer the computer will work. Come on. Come on, come on, please. Ready, please. This case first on the November twenty. Oh my God! Why? Why are you doing this to me, computer? Okay, let's see here. Why are you doing this to me, computer? Okay, I'm trying to let's see. Oil oils were missing. Now I gotta try going. Okay, here we go. When Lieutenant. Ulibari learned of Father Kerrigan's disappearance. He flew to Ronan to investigate the similarities between the two cases. He says that in both cases, the killer wanted people to know that he killed the priest by leaving evidence behind. He believes that whoever killed Father Rivera was also involved with in Father Kerrigan's disappearance. See, this is where they still have him. They're talking about his disappearance. But the thing is, if the, that much blood was found, in in the car on the on the seat on the floorboard on the panel in the trunk on the shovel i'm really guessing that kerrigan is not alive so i don't know why they're still trying to put this as a disappearance yeah they never found the body but the evidence of all the blood should be a logical conclusion that he was most likely murdered Okay. The other, there are other similarities between the two cases. Both victims are of the are about the same age, and drove brown Chevrolets. Both were last seen at night and disappeared in late July or early August. Both cars had been wiped down and were driven away from the crime scene. Both of their sacramental holy oils used for last rites are missing. I still think that this is, I think that these are hits and these holy oils and last rites kit being uh, missing. I think they were taken as identification because if somebody just wanted money, there was $1,200 in Kerrigan's in the trunk with Kerrigan. They would have taken that. It, was, it wasn't like it was even hidden. As I said, it was literally in a box marked wallets. No, I think these things are missing as a way of identifying to make sure that the correct target was removed, basically. And if we are dealing with somebody who is issuing hits against priests, we should look at the reason why. And the only thing I could think of is maybe that this person who is who ordered the hits, if they were hits of Ronaldo Rivera and John Kerrigan, it could be because maybe that this, the person that issued these hits are, uh, was a victim of, you know, of the priest of sexual, uh, misconduct, I guess you could say. Now in the, and later on in, I think it's in the up in the results or whatever. I think that they do mention it. It's either in this wiki or the other one, but they mentioned that one of these priests was, uh, he was reassigned because his name was uh, lo located like on a registry of uh, sexual offenders. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, so let's hope that the computer will work for us. Come on. I know you want to. I know you want to. Come on. Please. Asti writes are missing. I'll, I'll take that. Father take Rivera's that. body and Father Kerrigan's clothes were found in remote areas near roads outside of town. A deformed metal coat hanger was found near Father Kerrigan's clothes, and there is evidence a coat hanger was used in Father Rivera's murder. In both cases, robbery was not a motive. Perhaps most significantly, both priests belonged to the select order of Franciscans. It was also discovered that Father Kerrigan had been at a monastery in Hema Springs, New Mexico, for three months in the spring of 1983. Uh, it said that he was there for further education. 
And that sounds kind of ominous if you ask me, but, you know. Okay, let's see here. One major difference was that Father Kerrigan had just recently arrived in Ronan, while Father Rivera had been at St. Francis Cathedral in Santa Fe for over 15 years. The other major difference was that Father Kerrigan's body was never found. Although Lieutenant Ulibari believes the cases are connected, other investigators disagree. Lieutenant Ulibari hopes that other law enforcement agencies with similar cases of murdered Catholic priests will contact him. He believes that there's a possibility that there's a serial killer targeting Catholic priests. You know, I want to see here. Well, let's do a quick research, shall we? Um, how many Catholic or Catholic priests have been murdered? Okay, we got a Catholic priest convicted of murder. Uh, Catholic priest sexual case, abuse cases by country. Uh, why priests keep getting murdered? Oh, wow. We uh, got, okay, these are, hold on. Oh, wow, we got a couple others. Let's, let's see here. Why priests keep getting murdered in Mexico? Oh, these, this is Mexico also. Mexico is a highly violent area anyway. You got drug cartels and everything. Okay, let's back out of that. Um, bodies of murdered priests in Mexico. Catholic Church at public probably over two murdered priests. Every it's all it looks like it's uh mainly like the those two that were murdered in Mexico, so I guess we won't really be able to find let's see here. Let's let's try oh hold on. Come on. Okay, we'll just do it this way. In the United States. And it goes to the sexual abuse. I like how I, I'm I'm putting down the word murdered. I'm literally putting the word murdered in the search and I'm getting sexual abuse. I don't want sexual abuse. I want to know like how many of these guys have been murdered. Let's see. And the, th the weird thing is if I actually put down sexual abuse in the search search term why would i not be shocked if i actually got how many priests have been murdered it'd be like a weird ops thing uh let's see here allegations investigations it really doesn't literally i'm wanting to know about how many people were, are murdered and i'm getting everything but that uh, thank you, Bing. Let's try Google. Let's try Google. Google, you know where you can, you know, it's like the premier place you can go and get searches. Let's see here. Any cat. Priest. Been murdered in the United States. Oh, we got a couple. We got, let's see here. Okay. Well, according to this, we have in 2023, we have the auxiliary bishop of Los Angeles was killed by the husband of his housekeeper. And his name was Bishop David O'Connell. And then we had Father Stephen Guts, Guts, Gutzel, a priest at St. John the Baptist Catholic Church in and Fort Calhoun, Nebraska, was stabbed to death in the rectory. Well, that's that's ominous. Okay. Priests were religious. It, it kind of goes along with the same thing. It deals with allegations and sexual assaults. Nothing really what I'm looking for, though. Okay. But at least we know that in 2023, there was a couple, though. My phone was, according to the report, a priest and religious. 
didn't have to murder 2023 slightly higher than okay so yeah let's, let's let's do this let's go down let's 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 see if let's see if it'll work come on please please i have a feeling it's not gonna work this case yep i thought so okay Okay, so we were just before suspects. Okay, here we go. The following, uh, following Father Rivera's murder, a, a cross was placed at the spot where his body was found. Since then, it has been stolen and replaced several times. It is not known if the, if the thefts of the crosses, oh, fuck you, are uh, related to his murder. Okay, so now we are, are we are at suspects. Let's try it again. Come on. Really, Microsoft, you need to fix this shit. You need to fix this shit, Microsoft. Are related to his murder. Okay, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take suspects. It. The man who talked to Father Rivera on the phone on the night of the murder identified himself as Michael Carmelo. He said he was driving a blue pickup truck. A man with this name was located in Arizona. He passed a polygraph test and was later ruled out. The police have not found any other suspects with this name and believe it was an alias. The police believe, based on the fact that Father Rivera was a strong individual, that at least two people were involved. The weapon used in the murder was of .357 caliber or more and was a high-powered weapon, either a magnum pistol, handgun, or rifle. Unidentified fingerprints, a palm print, and hair samples were found in Father Rivera's car. They are believed to ha. Now, didn't they say earlier in... Okay, hold on. They believe to have belonged to the killer or killers. Okay, hold on. Let me... Didn't they say that both cars were wet clean, though? Hold on, let's... White clean. Uh, so you driven the car, it had been wet clean... Okay, they're seeing Father Rivera's car. Uh, let's see here. Wipe clean. Yeah, it sounds like both cars were wiped clean. Father Rivera's car was uh, from Santa Fe was wiped clean. And then uh, John Kerrigan his vehicle when it had been discovered that it was wiped clean of fingerprints. I'm wondering if they're only talking about the possibility of, uh, let's see, fing fingerprints being, hold on me, where's the suspects portion at? Extra notes, wait, hold on. Oh, that's results. Okay, suspects. Uh, ruled out. Believe that alias. Wrong individual. Identified pump. Finger. Okay, so either Megan hang on, uh, identified, unidentified fingerprints, a palm print, and hair samples were found in Father Rivera's car. But they're saying the car was wiped down, though. I can understand hair samples. Okay, I can understand them finding hair samples, but they literally said unidentified fingerprints, a palm and a palm print was found at Father Rivera's car. However, it clearly states here that uh, someone had driven the car and it had been wiped clean. So exactly, you know, I, I'm not sure because this is technically a Wikipedia, so anybody can really add this information. So it's, but let's say that this is legitimate. I gotta rewatch the case again. I watched it, but I didn't. I watched it just before I started recording this, but I didn't catch this detail. So either, you know, the wiki they made a mistake about the whole wiped clean, or possibly the reenactors, the the people who were being interviewed, messed up. But they're saying that something was found in the car, but the car had been wiped. 
that the car had been wiped clean. Where's the suspect portion? Ah, okay. Yeah, it's that they uh, see a couple. Basically, it was wiped clean, but they found all these different things. Yeah. Okay. The motive w was not believed to be. Uh, here, let me actually select this. Yeah, close this out. The motive was not believed to be robbery, as uh, only Father Rivera's last rites kit was taken some sources dispute this stating that other items were taken the police suspect that the kit was taken as a souvenir so the killer could relive the crime the police suspect that the killer wanted to kill wanted to kill any priest not just father rivera the fbi created a psychological profile of the killer according to the profile the killer's Motive was revenge, which could lead to the idea that the uh, killer or the person who ordered the killing could have been a victim of the church, basically. The profile claims that the killer wanted to get back at the Catholic Church and believes that it betrayed him in some way. The police believe the killer is familiar with the Catholic Church. Lieutenant Ulibari believes that Father Rivera and Father Kerrigan cases are connected. He believes that the killer was a drifter with a psychological problem with priests. They are, there are several similarities between the two cases. However, some investigators do not believe they are connected. If this was uh, a drifter, you would think that the drifter would have taken the $1,200 from... Uh, Father Kerrigan. Drifters have a have a reputation of possibly uh, being poor. So you would think that they would possibly see that, you know, you know, have at least looked in that box that said wallets. And they would have seen the, the twelve hundred dollars and they would have snagged that money. There's also the one hundred dollars that was found in I think it was uh, Rivera's shirt. I, I I don't think this was I don't think this was robbery. I think that this was possibly a hit, and the the person ordering the hit uh, requ requested uh, a form some something that belonged to these priests in order to for the hitmen to be paid basically. Okay, let's let's see here. Will the computer read this? Come on. Please, please, pretty please. Not believe they are connected. Okay, I'll, I'll take Father that. I'll Rivera's take that. brother believes that the murder was committed by a satanic cult. He claims that during the search, he found a cave that was used for devil worship. However, there is no other evidence to support this theory. According to Lieutenant Ulibari, Satanism was ruled out because no strange markings related to the occult were found on Father Rivera's body. The police followed up on several leads in their initial investigation. One initial suspect was a stranger who was seen in Grants, New Mexico, shortly after the murder. He was believed to have stolen a car from a tavern owner in Grants that day. However, police ruled him out after it was discovered he was I. He was in jail uh, on the night of the murder. Was... Um... Regarding the whole Satanist uh, angle, uh, no, I'm not buying that at all. You got to remember that this was in the 80s, the early 80s, especially. This was during the heyday of Satanic Panic. Uh, I think that the brother, I think he was just trying to possibly, you know, find a justification for the murder of his loved one. And if he, if, you know, if he thinks that he... You can see things in items. A guy found a cave. Okay, there, there's caves all around the place. He could have seen markings on the inside of caves. It could have literally just be chicken scratch on the walls from the formation of the cave itself. And his mind, he may take that to be, you know, Satanist language or whatever. Uh, no, I don't think it was Satanist. I think it was... I don't, I don't think it was Satanist at all. Uh... 
I can't say, I can't explain why. It just does not feel like this was a whole Satanist. I, I would believe that it was a Satanist that was part of the Son of Sam case. I would believe that before that I would even believe this. And I don't even believe Satanists were part of Son of Sam. That's how much I do not believe that Satanists were involved in this case. I'd rather believe another a Satanist claim from another case before I would this one. Okay. Okay, let's continue on. Okay, come on, please. Jail on the night of the murder. Another okay. initial suspect was a man who had been paroled just three days before the murder. He had served time for burglary, robbery, and drug-related offenses. On the day of his release, he was supposed to report to a drug rehabilitation program, but he did not show up. He was seen in Santa Fe on the day before the murder. However, he was ruled out after his fingerprints were found not to match those in Father Rivera's car. Also, two witnesses confirmed that he was Y. That he was with them on the night of the murder. Now, isn't this kind of weird? Isn't this kind of weird that they easily believe that this guy did not commit the murder because of, uh, of there being two people that literally, you know, was with them, that were with him. However, there was a case that I covered quite a while ago. Let's see here. Let's see here. Um, Michael Martin. I think it was a Michael Martin case. Yep. Okay, so two people, the, the, the police do not believe that this guy did the kill, did the murder because he was with two people. However, in the Michael Martin case from 1979, he was literally seen by like what five people, and three of those people, yeah, I think it was either two or three of those five people, were watching Battlestar Galactica with this guy, and the police did not believe that this guy was not was not was innocent. The court did not believe this guy was innocent. You know, like I love how you have kind of lopsided sometimes. I guess you could say. This guy had five witnesses literally telling everybody, yeah, this guy could not commit the robbery. Did not believe it at all. You know. But this guy, who apparently uh, he was in a drug, re supposed to be in a drug rehabilitation program, he was seen, he was only with, he was with two people that night. Oh, yeah, he couldn't have killed these guys. Oh, no, he's okay. You know, like, like what the fuck? Seriously, what the fuck? Okay. You didn't think I'd remember the Michael Martin case, did you? I remember everything. Okay, sometimes. <laughs> okay, I'll read this part. Two more suspects of Marcus were oh, two more suspects were Marcus Harris and his teenage accomplice. They reportedly killed Reverend Donald Hamilton, a priest in Arizona in 1982. However, they were also cleared of any involvement in Father Rivera's murder. James Reyes, the alleged killer of Father Patrick Ryan, was investigated as well. Father Ryan was killed in a motel room in Odessa, Texas. What is it with these guys being killed in the, in the American Southwest? And in the American South? Like, what the fuck? Holy shit. Uh, in 1981, Reyes was cleared uh, when it was discovered that he was working in Memphis, Tennessee, at the time Father Rivera was, was murdered. I was walking in Memphis. Okay. Okay, let's try this. Come on, please. The time of Father Rivera's murder. Another suspect was a transient from Beverly Hills, California. He allegedly robbed a church and threatened a clergyman in Utah. However, he was ruled out after it was discovered that he was not in New Mexico at the time of the murder. Police later received a tip from a man in Sacramento, California, who said another man had bragged about killing a priest. That man was identified and questioned. It was discovered that he was in a mental hospital at the time of the murder. Interestingly, police learned that the tipster was from Santa Fe and had a criminal record. However, police could find. He had a criminal record. 
However, police could find no evidence to link him to the murder. I would be checking this guy. He had a criminal record. Uh, I would start digging into this person. Okay, holy shit, this case. Like I said, this is a long-ass case. And this is just... Well, th they covered both priests, but I'm not sure, like I said, if the information is the same in both wikis. So, in the next installment, I will be covering uh, Father John Kerrigan's wiki. Okay, let's, let's go down to here. Okay, uh, read aloud. Please, please be nice. Work. Oh, evidence to link him to the murder. Police have one suspect that they have been unable to rule out. A tipster claimed that George Semkis, a former Santa Fe resident, was involved in Father Rivera's murder. Semkis was known to be in the area at the time. He robbed Fenn Galleries in Santa Fe at gunpoint, stealing a Rolex watch. He was also suspected of being involved in several other burglaries and robberies in the area. After Semkis was arrested in November 1982, he was sent to a mental hospital in Las Vegas for observation. While there, he and another man escaped and stole a car. He eventually made his way to New York, where he was arrested in August 1983. The car he was driving contained items taken from a burglary. A pistol was found in the glove compartment. He was later convicted of being in possession of stolen. Stolen property and having a concealed weapon. Well, it sounds like this guy could be a good suspect. Okay, so I will read this portion here. While in prison in New York, Semkis was interviewed and polygraphed by Santa Fe investigators. The results of the polygraph were never released. Gee, I wonder why. According to the police, he fits the FBI's psychological profile of the killer. According to another Franciscan, uh, to another Franciscan police, Semkis had previously stolen a lock. Con, 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 he stole this thing, whatever it is. Uh, oh, it's a statue from Father Rivera's Cathedral. When he was arrested, he hoped that the Franciscans would ask for clemency for him. However, they did not. Afterward, he allegedly told a fellow prisoner that he would settle things one day with the priest from the cathedral. Semkis reportedly flew to Santa Fe from New, Me uh, from New York. On the day of the murder, however, please do not have enough evidence to connect him to the crime. The guy literally said he was going to go down there and and settle things. How much more do you fucking need? It sounds like he had motive. He had uh, reasoning. He had, uh, like, determination. You know, it sounds like this guy could, this Semkiss person could be one of the people responsible. Extra notes. God, we're, we're, we still have a shit ton left. Well, not that much. Okay. Look. This case first aired on the November 23rd, 1998 episode. It was profiled on the Trail Went Cold podcast and on the case Paula Zahn. It is not to be confused with Ray Rivera. Some sources state that Father Rivera vanished on August 7th. The call came in at 8.35 p.m. The caller's father was dying. Father Rivera's car was a Chevrolet Chevelle. His body was found in a muddy field. His glasses, wallet, and keychain were also missing, and his pants pockets were turned inside out. Father Rivera is sometimes referred to as a reverend. Okay, time for the results. Okay, let's. I'm just gonna get see if the uh, computer can read all this. So let, 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 let's hope. Let's hope. Uh, read aloud. R results. Come on. Let's do it. Please. Please. May be responsible for Father Ryan and Father Rivera's murders. Okay, so apparently it's not going to. I will. Okay, results. Unsolved. In March 2003, Semkis was released on parole. He has never been charged... In the case, in 2009, the Archdiocese of Santa Fe dedicated a new wing to Saint Fra of at Saint Francis Cathedral to Reverend or to Father Rivera's me memory. Mm. Okay, 
Yeah. In April 2015, the Roman Catholic Diocese of Hel Helena, or Hel yeah, Helena, published a list of employees who had been suspected or implicated of sexual abuse of children. Father Kerrigan was included on the list and has been theorized that he was killed by one of his former abuse victims or someone related to uh, one of the victims. Who knows, this could have been what happened to uh, Revol uh, Ronaldo Rivera also. And this would go with the whole idea that this could have been a hit job also. However, the theory has not been confirmed. Lieutenant Ulubari no longer believes that Father Kerrigan and Father R Rivera's cases are connected. Uh, there has been speculation that Father Rivera's murder has was connected to the murder of Father Ryan. Although James Reyes was convicted of his murder, many of those chose uh, close to the case now believe he is innocent. There is even speculation of an unknown man who committed suicide in Boise, Idaho Church in 1982, William Toomey. That is an interesting case, by the way. May be responsible for Father Ryan and Father Rivera's murders. However, this theory has not been confirmed either. The New Mexico State Police Cold Case Unit is currently investigating Father Rivera's case and uh, following up on leads. In 2021, they collected DNA and fingerprints from an inmate in Texas to compare to evidence from the crime scene. However, the inmate was not a match. Sadly, Father Rivera's mother and most of his siblings have since passed away without in, without seeing his case solved, which is what I want. This is kind of like why I like doing these uh, videos because of the fact that people are dying, are connected to a lot of these cases, and we need to try to get these cases solved because it's going to get to a point in the future where everybody who is connected to every one of these cases is dead. And then after the, after everybody's dead, who's going to be there to help? You know, keep keep this going. Keep the keep the word alive and everything. Or keep the word going. In. You know what I'm trying to say. Okay, so we have Father Ronaldo Rivera at find a grave. Uh, I don't know what FR stands for. I don't I don't know what that means. But uh, Ronaldo John Rivera, date of birth. October 20, uh, October 29, 1924, in Santa Fe County, New Mexico, USA. Date of death was August 5th, 1982. He was 57. He, was, he died in the same location he was born, basically. Santa Fe. Hold on, let's close that. Wait, no, thank you. Uh, burial was at Rosario Cemetery in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It just says uh, murdered victim age 57 priesthood at age 29 wow almost 30 years or a little over 30 years i should say no oh, no under yeah under professed at age 37. parents was uh father was i think i'm actually okay i can't tell if this is a male or female name because it's it's Juan b rivera and Maybe it's a mother. Hold on, let's just do a quick look. Um, does this let's see here? Yeah, it doesn't say. I'm kind of confused about what the gender of that of his parent is because it, both names are kind of confusing me. But anyway, we have Ron B. Rivera from 1895 to 1943, and Riff Ugito Kuka Ortiz Rivera. From 1897 to 1994. Siblings. We, wow, we have a few siblings. Okay, hold on. Let's zoom out. Siblings. Uh, Nicolasita, Angela, Nikki, Rivera, Drosten. 1917 to 2018. Wow, 101 years old. Mary Elizabeth Isabel Rivera from 1920 to 1996. Ernestine Rivera Wright from 1923 to 
Mary Frances Rivera Webb from 1927 to 2017, and Fred Jose Rivera from 1930 to 2005. Okay, we got some photos here. So we got the this was from the episode itself. And then I, I actually like this picture. It showed him in his outfit. And then finally we have hit the tombstone. Uh Ronaldo Rivera OFM died August 5th, 1982. He was 57. And professed 37. And then preset at 29. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen. That was the case of Father Ronaldo, Ronaldo John Rivera and John Kerrigan. And we will go more into John Kerrigan in the next uh installment of black site falls from unsolved mysteries i want to say thank you to jasmine for uh joining us and that is about it so i'm going to take a little bit of a break because my throat is actually getting a little bit dry and sore from all this talking and i will return in a little bit with my final thoughts it's something to see when the pepsi generation plays the game one flick of the wrist, it's a whole new twist, and football's not the same. Come on, come on, come on, and taste the Pepsi way. Generation, come on, come on, come on, and have the Pepsi day. All across the nation, have the Pepsi day. Okay, guys. Time for my final thoughts. Uh, this case, as you can see, th this one actually took quite a while. That's why I am not jumping into the John Kerrigan uh, portion of the Franciscan connection. That's what I've, I'm calling it until at a later date. It'll be, it definitely will be the next video, but it's just not going to be today. Um, my final thoughts. We have two mysteries here, ladies and gentlemen. We have a... a we have a priest who was murdered. Father uh, Ronaldo Rivera was brutally murdered. He was shot in the abdomen with a three fifty seven, And we have a, another uh, priest who just disappeared one night after visiting a bakery. The question is, who did it and why? Now, I've made my, uh, I've made my points, you know, throughout this video. I think that it could have been uh, like a hit job and that the missing uh, missing kit, uh, God, I can't recall what it's called, the last rights kit, I think that's, is that what it's called? The, 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 the kit from Father Ronaldo Rivera along with some oils from John Kerrigan. I think that those were mainly used, uh, uh, stolen basically or taken as a way to show whoever ordered this hit that the job was done as you heard through from you know what was read it's not a it's not a case of robbery in the car of Ronaldo Rivera there was a wallet that was found that had twelve hundred dollars and I'm not sure if it was uh, Ronaldo Rivera's shirt or if it was John Kerrigan's shirt but in the pocket of a shirt a hundred dollars was found Clearly, this was not a case of uh, of robbery, since a total of thirteen hundred dollars was left between the two people. So, if it wasn't robbery, because the money was still there, and the the, the vehicle was still that was both vehicles were located, what else could it be? What else could it be? And that's ultimately what it is that we need to figure out, ladies and gentlemen. I, like I said, I've said what I think it is. I think it was a hit. Uh, the reason could be possibly the, the victim, the person who ordered the hit, could have been one of the many sexual assault victims of the Catholic Church. But we don't know. And that is why, hopefully, you are a... That's why you are here, ladies and gentlemen. It only takes one person to uh, learn to figure out what... The deal is and possibly help solve these crime this case i want to say these crimes it is a crime it is a crime but we're trying to figure out this case and hopefully maybe one of these days 
It could just be somebody who just may have overheard something. And because of that, they may be able to uh, finally, you know, get that last piece of the puzzle. You know. But that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, you know, I'm going to get this uploaded. And then sometime either this next weekend, well, hopefully be the next this next weekend. I will have part two of the Franciscan Connection, which it revolves around uh, Father John Kerrigan. So that is it. My name is Jeff, a.k.a. G. Curse. As always, if you liked what you watched, which I hope that you did, feel free to click on that subscribe button. It's just a little thing, but it helps me a lot. And I will see you next time for part two of the Franciscan Connection. My name is Jeff, a.k.a. G. Curse, wishing you all a great evening. Happy Labor Day, and stay safe, everybody. Peace out. When you shoot a lot of pool and bars, you want to stay fast and loose, and you don't want to get filled up. That's why I drink light beer from Miller. It's got a third less calories than their regular beer, and it's less filling. Plus, the taste is great. And even though a lot of people don't think pool is strenuous, let me tell you something. You can work up a real good thirst, even when you're just showing off. Light beer from Miller. Everything you always wanted in a beer, and less.